place names of Somerset, ringing down time. Queer, quaint and musical, hark to their chime. Coombe Flory, Montacute, Hatch Beecham, Mells, Hewish Episcopi, Milverton, Wells. What desert gypsy of Queen Camel thought, by Norton Fitzwarren whose mind was first caught? Is Monk Silver haunted by arboreal friars? And what means Stogumba with Eliscum Ash Priors? Did sanctified footsteps go thoughtfully through Stokes and Gregory Village, St Audrey's too, and of course Bishop's Lydiard? What far summer hour made fragrant the meadows of Hewish Chamflower? Did they always at Crocombe indulge in Rook Pie? And up to road water are the floods often high. The place names of Somerset they cry and they call. Provocative, pleasant, I'm in love with them all. I have at least two things in common with Teresa Hooley, the author of that poem, published in 1945. I was not born or raised in Somerset, but having moved there as an adult, one of the things I readily fell in love with is the diverse array of charming place names. Whimsical, quirky, poetic, they're sometimes unreasonably satisfying to say. In this video, I'm going to dig into some etymology and see how history blessed us with these delightful names. I only hope that by explaining some of the many recurring features and patterns behind these names, I am not metaphorically dissecting a frog. The very first name in her poem, Cum Flory, could hardly be a better example of what I mean by recurring features and patterns, as it embodies at least two of them. The first word, Cum, means valley, deriving from Old English, cognate to Welsh Cum, with common roots back to Britonic. This is a very common place name element in England generally, but is particularly common in the southwest. Somerset alone is overflowing with examples. Coombe Hay, Coombe Throop, Coombe Down, Beercrookham, Abbascom, Batcom, Buckcom, Chaffcom, Crosscom, Crocom, Cutcom, Englishcom, Templecom, Timberscom, Nettlecom. At this point I should probably interrupt myself to add a disclaimer. Local pronunciations are often not what you might think from the spelling and since I don't have local knowledge of each and every place in this video, I'm bound to be saying a lot of them wrong. Back to Coom Flory though, and the second word of the name is a textbook example of another one of the biggest patterns in these delicious Somerset place names. Flory is a corruption of the name Hugh de Flurry, who was Lord of the Manor here around 1166. This is an extremely common explanation for Somerset's two-word village names, Hardington Mandeville, Chilton Cantello, Hewish Champflower, Orchard Portman, Hazelbury Plucknet, Hinton Blewett. You wonder, who's Hinton and where did it all go wrong? But actually Blewett is from Blewett, because as in many cases this noble family name is French, or perhaps more accurately Norman, whereas the first word of the village name tends to be derived from an older linguistic presence, either Anglo-Saxon or sometimes Celtic. Usually this element is somewhat generic and geographical, Hinton, for example, simply means high settlement. Coombe, as we saw, means valley, whereas Shepton is the Anglo-Saxon for sheep farm, and the Carey in Carey Fitz Payne is the name of the local river, of uncertain Celtic or pre-Celtic origin. Likewise, Compton Pornsfoot, Norton Fitzwarren, Charlton Mackerel, and many others use the manorial family name to distinguish between umpteen other Comptons and Nortons and Charltons, these being extremely basic Anglo-Saxon place names. The French-slash-Norman names are often somewhat disguised by centuries-old anglicisation. For example, Shepton Beecham is Beecham and not Beauchamp. Shepton Mallet, meanwhile, was named after the Mallet family, which by modern French standards I might guess was actually pronounced Mallet. Anyway, William Mallet was one of William the Conqueror's senior associates at the Battle of Hastings. Somewhere along the line it turned into Mallet and another L got added to the spelling in the 16th century. There's also a Sutton Mallet and a Curry Mallet, the latter being near Curry Rival. It's the same old story. Rival comes from the family name of its 12th century landlord. The Curry part, although unusual as a village name, is in a sense again quite generic, in that it derives from a generic geographical word from a pre-Norman tongue, a Celtic word meaning boundary. Hewish is another one of these unusual but also ultimately generic first words, it derives from Hewish, Saxon for homestead. Even amongst such a crowded field of excellent names, Hewish Episcopi has got to stand as one of my absolute favourites. Episcopi relates to Episcopal, that is pertaining to a bishop, because it was owned by the Bishop of Bath and Wells. Religious explanations account for an awful lot of these names actually, 
Something Saint Something is a very common pattern. Theresa Hooley called out Stokes St Gregory as her example, but there's also Barton St David, Buckland St Mary, Sevington St Michael, Hinton St George, Peasdown St John, and so many more. The general explanation for these is quite simple. The village church is dedicated to that saint. Just like the noble family names were affixed to very generic Anglo-Saxon village names, there is a major element of disambiguation to this naming convention. The Stoke in Stokes and Gregory, for example, is possibly one of the most common place name elements in England, deriving from the old English Stoke, which was originally about as vague as place. Even in Somerset there's a Stoke Subhamden, Stoke Trista, Stoke St Michael, Rodney Stoke and more besides. Likewise, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of Bartons and Kingstons in England, but only one Barton St David and Kingston St Mary. Chiltern Trinity offers a very minor variation on this theme with its parish church of the Holy Trinity, rather than a particular saint. While Hooley also mentions Bishop Lydiard as distinct from nearby Lydiard St Lawrence, much like the Episcopi villages, the bishop in question was the Bishop of Wells. To mop up some of the other names from Hooley's poem, Montacute is somewhat unclear. It may come from the Latin Montacutus, referring to the conical hill that the village sits beneath, but that's hardly a mountain, and it may instead come from the de Montague family, who once again were chums of William the Conqueror and ended up lords of the manor in these parts. They originated from Montague-le-Bois in modern-day France, whose name was recorded as Mont Acuto in around 1040, because it also has steep hills. So my best guess is that the French village was named after the Latin description of the mountains, and then the family were named after that village, and then the Somerset village was named after that family. But nobody on the internet seems terribly certain what order it came in, and what was named after what. Queen Camel relates not to deserts or desert-adapted animals. Wikipedia says the camel is a corruption of Cantmel, which in turn may have been from the Celtic words for district and bare hill, and that the queen in the village's name is probably Queen Eleanor, the wife of Henry III, who owned land in the area in the 13th century. A few of my other favourites that Hoodie did not feature in her verse, Temple Cloud, the temple is most likely from the Knights Templar holding the manor here around 1200 AD, and the cloud part is either derived from a personal name or the Old English for rocky outcrop. Nearby Clutton has the same etymology, apparently. Dowlish Wake follows the same pattern I've been harping on about, Wake from the family name of medieval landowners, and Dowlish from a geographical feature, the Dowlish Brook, which in turn is apparently from the Celtic for dark stream. I have no idea how Hooley resisted including Nemnet Thrubwell, because, honestly, Nemnet Thrubwell, what an incredible name. But the etymology seems very unclear. Wikipedia says Mnet was Old English for level ground, and Thrubwell is unclear but might mean gushing stream. But another source I found says it's from Celtic words Nemet meaning grove, and the Old English wheel meaning well. So frankly, who knows? I guess that's enough frog dissection for now, as we're getting into either repetitive explanations or I don't know. So I'll wrap up the place names here. I was going to throw in a bonus mini-biography of Teresa Hooley, who is a rather interesting woman, but I've got no footage to pad it out with visually, so I'll just recommend you look her up. Special thanks to the internet friend who found the full poem for me. The internet failed me, Bristol libraries failed me, I even registered at the British Library and went all the way to London to look at their Hooli anthologies, to no avail. But this guy went out of his way to dig it out of the Bodleian. I'm very much obliged. Anyway, that's all for this video. Cheers!